Controversy involving video games is nothing new. The medium has been home to its fair share of scrutiny in the past. From bedroom-bound solo developers releasing whatever they could imagine up, to multi-million dollar AAA studios attempting to shock and tell a horrific story. Controversy surrounding various forms of media is something which has been around long before the explosion of video game popularity. Freaks, a 1932 movie about various carnival sideshow acts enacting revenge on a woman after she uses and mocks one of their own. The film was heavily censored after a disastrous test screening, with apparently people running out of the theatre horrified by what they had just seen, with one woman even threatening to sue MGM after claiming the film had caused her to miscarry. The Pill a 1975 country music song recorded by Loretta Lynn about, you guessed it, the pill. Compared to music of today, this song wouldn't even cause you to bat an eye. But in 1975, it was seen as incredibly risque to have talks of birth control, especially in a country music song. Subsequently, causing it to be seen as not fit for radio. And for a time, many radio stations even refused to play it. But that didn't stop it from becoming her biggest charting pop single. Controversy, censorship, risque subjects. It's nothing new in the world of art, so of course over time, that would start to bleed into the world of video games. The spectrum of what's acceptable and too offensive to be shown has shifted a fair amount over the last 100 years or so, but an opinion which not surprisingly hasn't altered all that much over the years is the subject of sexual assault, which is why it's questionable that a game like this would even exist in the first place. Custer's Revenge is an adult sex game released for the Atari 2600 in 1982 seemingly based off the real-life historic figure George Armstrong Custer. The game has you controlling a naked Custer, avoiding incoming arrow attacks as you attempt to make your way to the opposite side of the screen to have sex with a captive Native American woman. As you might expect, Custer's revenge quickly gained a notion of notoriety, being criticised by various women's rights groups and Native American spokespersons. With the uproar that this game had created, there was even pressure on legislators to outlaw the game which Oklahoma City, in fact, did. The game's creators would add fuel to the fire with statements such as, When people play our games, we want them smiling. We want them laughing. Custer was seducing the maiden, and she was a willing participant. Even though Mystique, the game's developers, had been known to release edgy adult games in the past, like Bachelor Party and Beat 'em and Eat 'em, that wouldn't stop Custer's revenge from ultimately being pulled from circulation. A few years prior to Custer's Revenge, in 1976, Exidy released Death Race into the arcades, the objective being to mow down any pedestrians on screen to rack up points. Pretty tame by today's standards with games like Carmageddon, but in 1976 the US Safety Council didn't seem to think so, with a spokesperson saying in a 1976 review, one of its insidious and probably unrecognised characteristics is its shift from imaginary visual images of destruction, as you have in TV violence, to actual behavioural actions taken by the player. With this being the early days of video games, and certain people being of the belief that media like music, movies and video games could encourage real life violence, any depiction of on-screen violence would have the potential to cause quite a stir. Violent and bloody games like 1986 Chiller, a gory light gun game where you have the ability to repeatedly shoot helpless captive NPCs, as well as 1988's brutal and satisfying beat em up Splatterhouse, would continue to push the boundaries and limits of what was acceptable. 
while heavily criticised by certain groups of people, with some arcade owners even going as far to refuse to even house the games, Chiller, Splatterhouse and other violent video games of the time would make it through relatively okay. The theme of sexualised adult oriented games didn't die out either. 1987 saw Leisure Suit Larry in the Land of the Lounge Lizards, a comedic graphic adventure game with the main theme being Larry attempting to get various women to sleep with him, going for a tongue in cheek approach with Larry clearly being disillusioned and having no real life understanding of women, but that didn't stop various stores from refusing to stock or even advertise the game. All through the 1970s, 80s and early 90s, there had been no uniform rating system for video games. Various publishers would sometimes add their own warnings and age ratings to their covers, and various companies like Sega did attempt at creating their own short-lived rating system. That was until the 16th of September 1994 with the birth of the ESRB, or Entertainment Rating Software Board, a non-profit self-regulatory organisation with the purpose of finding out what potential offensive material might be in a game, making it mandatory that it gets listed on the front cover or run the risk of facing the consequences of a heavy fine. Games like Mortal Kombat with its graphic displays of violence, Night Trap with its supposed promoting gratuitous violence and sexual aggression, and Lethal Enforcers where players shoot at digitised photos of real people, were the final nail in the coffin for unregulated video games. Doom, Hellslayer and Demon Ass Kicker. Doom and Doom 2 did so much in terms of taking the first person shooter genre to levels it had never seen before, with the estimated 10 million installs of the game, when there's that many eyes on it, there's bound to be some people out there who will find a problem with it. Heavily criticised by religious organisations due to its strong reliance on pentagrams, occult themes, demons and gore, that did little to slow down the ever increasing size of Doom's reach. One critic would go as far as to dub it a mass murder simulator, citing the then emerging virtual reality technology could be used to simulate extremely realistic killing. Doom would also be the subject of controversy once more in the unfortunate wake of the Columbine High School Massacre, with the perpetrators being avid fans of the games, and prior to the events, one would write in his journal, it'll be like the LA riots, the Oklahoma bombing, World War II, Vietnam, Duke Nukem, and Doom all mixed together. Providing once again, ample fuel for people to blindly blame forms of media for horrific actions of others, instead of looking deeper to find the root causes of these issues. Grand Theft Auto 3, Rockstar's foray into a 3D open world crime story, would be described as a murder simulator by Jack Thompson. An ex-attorney and campaigner against obscenity and violence in the media, he would be quoted as saying, Older men were using Grand Theft Auto 3 as a murder and carjacking simulator to train teens. The Grand Theft Auto series, of course being no stranger to controversy. To name a few, the hot coffee incident. Leftover code was found in the original release of GTA San Andreas, which was intended for a sexual intercourse minigame. Modders added back in the functionality and Rockstar would lose their initial rating of mature and would have to re-release the game without any trace to get it back. The torture scene. Grand Theft Auto V would feature a scene where a man is tied to a chair and repeatedly tortured with various different methods. Initially meant to be a spoof on how ridiculous torture for information is, this inclusion would cause outrage among human rights organisations. Freedom from Torture Chief Executive Keith Best says, Rockstar North has crossed the line by effectively forcing players to take on the role of a torturer and perform a series of unspeakable acts if they want to achieve success in the game.
As long as there is various forms of media, there will always be people out there who will find a reason to protest it. Soldier of Fortune, often finding itself on such lists as most controversial FPS games of all time, by today's standards doesn't do all that much to stand out. A fun and enjoyable experience for sure, but the main issue comes with the game's graphic and brutal dismemberment system. The Postal series, starting out life as an isometric mayhem simulator, the Postal games are ridiculous romps of campiness, offensive humour and gratuitous violence. Fun games which are not meant to be taken seriously at all, but have found themselves in moments of controversy when the topic of offensive stereotypes and mass murder on the game's populace gets brought up. In the same vein, Hatred, a game which tries far too hard to appear edgy, almost as if that's the point of it, similarly to Postal, has you gunning down civilians for no other reason than that's the objective of the game. Carmageddon, a vehicular racing game self-described as racing for the chemically imbalanced, where you can also win by pulverising your opponents repeatedly until they explode into a fiery ball. The controversial element comes into play because similarly to the movie Death Race 2000, this game rewards you for the pedestrians you run down, even allowing you to win if you kill them all a feature which would cause quite the uproar, leading to it to be censored and altered in many countries, with Brazil outright banning it. Six Days in Fallujah, an unreleased modern military game recreating the 2004 events of the Battle of Fallujah, came under heavy scrutiny for its vivid depiction of one of the most fierce battles in the Iraq War. With criticism from war veterans, military families and news stations, Six Days in Fallujah never saw the light of day, with Konami backing down from publishing the game due to its surrounding controversy. Sometimes it's not the game as a whole which causes backlash. Perhaps there's a certain part or feature within that kicks up some controversy. That's what happened to Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 with the mission No Russian. In quite a bold move for a AAA video game, it has you playing as an undercover CIA agent taking part in a mass shooting in a Russian airport as you attempt to win the trust of a Russian terrorist. The player isn't forced to pull the trigger and can pass through the level without doing so, but the horrificness of it all was a far step higher than what the game had shown previously. Infinity Ward clearly knew that its inclusion would be a decisive point, and even gave the player the ability to opt out of doing so and skipping the level in its entirety. Expectedly, the inclusion of the level caused there to be some degree of backlash, with gaming and major news publications describing the level's plot as illogical and ridiculing the ability to skip the level. Similarly, Resident Evil 5, released the same year as Modern Warfare 2, would also be the subject of controversy. With the game taking place in Africa, the controversy stemmed from the killing of black characters and their supposed racist portrayals. Pyramid Head, the figure of James Sunderland's guilt manifests itself into a rather disturbing and extreme way. Silent Hill 2's original portrayal of the monstrous character featured a cutscene which would be the subject of many criticisms in the years that would follow. Briefly, it appears that Pyramid Head is engaging in violent sexual acts towards two mannequin monsters. It's over in a matter of seconds, and due to the technological restrictions of the PS2, you're left not entirely certain about what you've just witnessed. But it would all but be confirmed with the release of Silent Hill 2 HD where Konami would self-censor and opt to remove the disturbing and potentially offensive scene altogether. Native American groups would take issue with 2005's gun, with groups stating the game glorifies racism and genocide and very disturbing racist and genocidal elements towards Native Americans, with the player being forced to kill a set number of Apaches to progress through levels and the prominent use of scalping within the game. Many found this unsettling and petitioned to Activision to remove derogatory, harmful and inaccurate depictions of American Indians from the game, otherwise the group would campaign for the removal of the game from retailers worldwide. The 
there's controversy due to potentially offensive material, whether it's intentional or not meant to be taken that way. But there's also controversy and anger among consumers when a game has been marketed in a specific way only to find out on release that it's drastically lacking many of the features boasted in its pre-release material. In some cases, games get released in states which make you wonder how they even made it past quality assurance and playtesters. The hype behind No Man's Sky was astronomical. The features this game was claiming to include seemed too good to be true. Infinite galaxies with countless different types of planets with their own unique weather systems and wildlife. The ability to land on an asteroid gliding through the solar system. No Man's Sky promised a lot on launch and when it released, ultimately failing to provide even the bare minimum of promised features, it reignited the discussion of getting hyped for video games and why people shouldn't pre-order. BioWare's Anthem would face a rather unfortunate fate, with many people saying that it was doomed from the start. A cooperative online looter shooter which was apparently played with issues all throughout its long development cycle, an experience half-baked which felt rushed, untested and unfinished. The game hyped for a better part of a decade would disastrously crash and burn in a pile of its own hype and shortcomings, never to fully recover. Assassin's Creed Unity, a game which was shipped in a laughably broken state, which was largely scrutinised and mocked for the abhorrent state of its release. Missing faces, terrible frame rate, and a sea of bug and glitches which the internet had a field day with. Even with Ubisoft being no stranger to controversy surrounding their game's releases, they experienced a rather embarrassing and unfortunate release here. Similarly to Anthem, Bioware's previous game, the long-awaited and astronomically hyped Mass Effect Andromeda, would be heavily scrutinised upon its release. A game which was supposedly in development for five years prior to release, only for all the progress to be scrapped a year and a half before the game came out, with a new version being quickly pushed out the door. As expected, resulted in more than its fair share of bugs and glitches, characters and textures looking woefully like they were from the generation previous, and facial animations that were downright strange. There's games which may be seen as controversial, like Night Trap, Doom or Manhunt, for their subject matter and the pushing of social boundaries aura surrounding them. There's games which may be controversial due to a feature in it or traces of it, like GTA San Andreas with the hot coffee incident. And then sometimes games kick up a stir due to the abysmal state in which they get released in, or over promising features, building up immense hype surrounding a title, only to have it release and be nothing like what it was stated. Then there's games which without a shadow of a doubt, earn their title as controversial. Games which don't feature perhaps one or two controversial elements, but instead being created entirely out of bad taste. There's plenty of bizarre media to come out of Japan over the years, mostly harmless, some questionable, and then there's this. Rayplay, a game about stalking and sexually assaulting women. As expected, the reception surrounding this game would not be a good one. A British Member of Parliament brought the news of the game to Parliament in 2009, resulting in Amazon removing its listings of the game. Human rights groups boycotted the game, resulting in it being practically unattainable, even in its home country of Japan. Super Columbine Massacre RPG, a rather tasteless recreation of the unfortunate events which took place on the 20th of April 1999 with the game's creator defending his project, claiming that his creation is art. Yet that did little to stop the negative attention that this game would receive. People affected by the shooting, friends, parents and loved ones would share their disgust at the existence of the game. Mainstream media weren't too happy about it either, largely referring to it as exploitative and a monstrosity, with CNN labelling the game as an example of subculture that worships terrorists. With many people living in first world countries, and that giving them widespread access to create whatever they want, the nasty little things tend to fall through the cracks, like anti-Semitism. It seems to weasel its way into all forms of media in one form or another, so of course there's video games surrounding it too. 
Ethnic Cleansing is a poorly made first person shooter, with the main objective being to kill minorities. A spokesperson for the group behind the creation of it considers video games to simply be another medium to promote his organization's messages. Getting ignored by the mainstream media, the reception by critics who did cover it was extremely negative. The game would find itself in magazines being referred to as one of the most controversial video games of all time and to the most racist video game in history. Games based around horrific historical events don't necessarily need to be done in bad taste. Video games allow for the education of such events to a new generation of players who might not have known just how significant of a role they played in history. Which might have been the initial idea behind JFK Reloaded, a simulation game designed to recreate the assassination of John F. Kennedy. The player is put into the role of Lee Harvey Oswald as he enacts the assassination from the Texas School Book Depository building. According to the developers of the game, the primary aim was to establish the most likely facts of what happened on that day by running the world's first mass participation forensic construction. The game would be condemned by John F. Kennedy's brother as despicable, with organisations dismissing the claim that it had any educational merit. Some critics would view the simulation away from the poor taste of its execution to be quite compelling, but the vast majority of reception surrounding the game was that it displayed a general lack of taste, and its approach regarding the subject matter was poorly handled. Controversy in games. It's been there from the beginning, and it's still here now. Where there's freedom of expression, there's controversy. That's just how it goes. Sometimes it's just, and sometimes it's an ignorant mistake. From the uproar of early video games' crudely depictions of violence, to developers vastly overpromising on their products, to downright hatred. We've looked at some of the forms of controversy and uproar video games have caused over the last 40 years or so. Just a few examples in the ever-growing sea which is the world of video games. The surface has barely been scratched on the topic, but I can't cover all of the cases out there. But if I were to do that, we'd be here for hours. Thanks for coming and stopping by. I'll see you later.